I really didn't want to write this piece. I felt in my bones for a long, long time, but I just couldn't get myself to finally get out of my system. Well, until now. Because it feels like if I don't say what I need to say, then it's going to explode out of me in a probably much more self-destructive way. So please be advised, the topics we're going to discuss today are sensitive and can be triggering for some. Because we're talking about I Kill Giants, aka the only book that's ever made me ugly cry. For those not aware, I Kill Giants was a seven-issue limited series released by Image Comics in 2008 and inspired the 2018 film of the same name. It featured art by Jim Kanemura and was written by Joe Kelly, who, for whatever reason, is not widely considered one of the best comic writers of all time, despite writing some of the most influential stories in comic history. You want to know who gave Deadpool everything you love about him today and inspired the now hugely popular film franchise? It sure as hell wasn't Rob Liefeld. What in the fucksicle is this? Anyway, I Kill Giants stars Barbara Thorson, a fifth grade girl who has a very rebellious personality and is big into fantasy lore and D&D. &D. As such, calling her a social outcast would be a pointed lightly. She has no real friends, frequently fights with her sister, and is often bullied at school. But she doesn't care about any of that because she knows something they don't. See, Barbara takes herself very seriously, and there's a good reason for that. Because according to her, some of these fantasy creatures are actually real and it's her self-imposed job to hunt down and kill the deadliest of these creatures, giants. Although, her sole and unyielding focus on giants makes her a bit standoffish, and often seems to either isolate her from her peers or get her in trouble at school. However, she pushes on despite the constant rejection because she wholeheartedly believes that she's the only one who can protect the people from these horrendous monsters. And that's how she be living her life, constantly preparing to fight giants using her tactical mind, her quick wit, and mysterious weapon she calls Kavelski which she hides securely in her handbag. But her obsession seems to offer no reprieve, as she is haunted by omens and signs that foretell their arrival. In the clouds, at school, and even her own home, where there appears to be some kind of monster so great that it forces Barbara to cower in fear. Things were soon to change, however, as one night, when she's lying out some giant bait, she is interrupted by Sophia, another fifth grade girl who is new in town and seems to be curious about Barbara's extracurricular activities. She's not the only new element in Barbara's life, though, as she's also introduced to the school's new psychiatrist, Mrs. Mole, who tries to bond with her to figure out the source of her aggressive and confrontational behavior. Barbara pushes both of them away, but they're both persistent and keep trying. Sophia is the first to break through Barbara's defensive layer after she saves her from the school bully, Taylor, after which Barbara decides to give her a proper chance. Much to her surprise, Sophia seems quite interested about giants, and she listens to Barbara as she tells her all about them. She regales her with their history and the different kinds that exist, including the worst of them all, the Titan. Titans are the stuff of legends, being the largest of the bunch and also completely unstoppable. This softens Barbara's edges enough to share that her weapon, Kavelski, is actually a warhammer she named after the 1908 Giants player, Harry Kavelski, who is often referred to as the Giant Killer. That's the most Sophia can get out of her though before she shuts down again and roams home to the monster she's too scared to face. While Barbara seems open to the idea of having a new friend and seems to enjoy her company, her confrontational behavior still persists, and she seems easily triggered by any mention of baseball or Kavelski. Mrs. Mole picks up on that and uses that as a way past Barbara's natural defensiveness during their next session. It seems like it might be working, until Mrs. Mole says something so triggering that not only does Barbara's brain literally refuse to hear it, but she becomes aggressive, slapping Mrs. Mole and running out of the room. She's then plagued by random visions of giants and is left emotionally numb for the remainder of the day. Things are only made worse when, on the way home, Barbara is confronted by Taylor and a fight ensues. During the scuffle, Sophia runs over to try to stop it, but Barbara instinctively turns and punches her in the face, causing her to run away in tears. Things don't improve much at home either, as her sister blows up on her for hitting Mrs. Mole, tricking Barbara yet again in the process. This leads to a lonely beach campfire, where she resorts to self-harm to cope. Sophia refuses to talk to her for fairly obvious reasons the next day, at which point Taylor, looking for some old-fashioned revenge, convinces her to talk about Barbara's giant traps in exchange for a secret about Barbara's mother. Taylor then proceeds to tear her set up to shreds, all the while Sophia watches. Barbara tries to intervene by drawing her great weapon Kavelski, only to find that, much to her surprise, Kavelski isn't the mighty weapon she thought it was, but just a simple keychain of a baseball bat. She doesn't have much time to dwell on this shock before she's beaten to a pulp by Taylor and her cronies, despite Sophia's protests. The following day, Barbara has seemingly disappeared. She doesn't go to school, and no one seems to know where she is. 
Sophia, feeling concerned and a little guilty, goes to Mrs. Mole for help and shares with her what she knows. Sophia eventually finds Barbara hiding out in the back room of a game store, where they argue about their hurt feelings. Barbara panics after Sophia reveals she brought Mrs. Mole to her house, and she runs into the street to start collecting dead animals for what she calls a sacrifice. It's Mrs. Mole who finds her this time and confronts her with the truth. Her mom is dying of cancer. She wants to see her, and she's running out of time. Deep in denial, Barbara literally pushes her away before running back to her traps as a storm looms ever closer. She finds Taylor waiting for her, seemingly out for blood, while Sophia is out there actively trying to stop her. All of them are interrupted, though, by the appearance of what Barbara has been preparing for and dreading all this time. A giant. But not just any giant, a titan, who towers over its adversary looking for a fight. Barbara is paralyzed with fear as the titan starts going after Taylor and Sophia. Much to her surprise, though, Barbara's Kavelsky handbag starts glowing. It's at this point that Barbara finds her courage, pulls out a massive, powerful warhammer, and loudly proclaims, you will not take her. Do you hear me? You will not take my mother. Barbara's rage and courage mixes with active defiance as she battles a titan, frequently proclaiming that he can't have her and nothing will take her, until eventually the titan stops fighting, and Barbara defiantly proclaims her victory, claiming that because she won, her mother gets to live. But then the titan speaks, and he says he didn't come for her mother. He came for her. And then her defiance melts to grief as she faintly whispers, I believe. I fought so hard. There isn't anything I could have done, was there? The Titan apologizes, seemingly genuinely empathetic. But Barbara refuses to accept it as she strikes one last killing blow before disappearing into the ocean. The following day, Barbara is still missing as the news reports of a sudden tornado that ripped through the small town. Sophia goes to visit Barbara's understandably terrified sister as the police tries to figure out the best way to find her, if they even can. Luckily, they don't have to look far, as soon after Sophia's arrival, Barbara appears at the front door, exhausted and a little worse for wear, but alive and seemingly at peace. She goes to the staircase to prepare to face her last giant, as she flashes back to her final moments with the Titan, who tells her what she needs to hear. All things that live, die. This is why you must find joy in the living, while the time is yours, and not fear the end. To deny this is to deny life. To fear this is to fear life. But to embrace this, can you embrace this? You are stronger than you think. So with that strength in mind, she goes up the stairs. And what does she find? An evil darkness? A monster beyond imagining? No. Just her mom, lying in a hospital bed connected to an IV. A little weak, but smiling. She crawls in a bed next to her and they just sit with each other. Barbara tries to apologize, but her mom stops her. She's just happy she's there. Her mom passes away shortly after, but while she's very sad and honest about it, she's found peace with it, reassuring Mrs. Mole that she's going to be okay. Later that night, Barbara looks upon the ocean from Mother's room and sees a titan looking back. But it's okay now. There's no enemies here. She reassures the titan too that she's all right and thanks him before he goes back to whence he came. Then the book ends as she curls into bed and repeats the Titan's wisdom. We're stronger than we think. This book is extremely personal to me, and I discovered it at a time where I really needed it. At its core, it's a story about trying to do the right thing in an impossible situation. About a little girl who wants to try to find a way to protect the few people she loves, but ultimately finds she can't. Everything she does and everything she has or creates represents not only what she's going to lose, but what she's already lost. She has no real friends to speak of before Sophia, so she creates fairies and fantasy creatures that only she can see and talk to. Her prized possession, Kavelski, is implied to be a keepsake from her father, who used to take her on baseball games, but abandoned her before the events of the book. Her attitude and confrontational nature is used as the ultimate shield to prevent the possibility of being vulnerable with another human being. In fact, a lot of the abandonment and loss she suffered through and is suffering through really speaks to how much she wants to be vulnerable, how much she wants to express how much she cares but doesn't really know how. Or if she does, she's terrified to do so because it just means she can lose someone again. And you can only be hurt by abandonment so many times before you start to recede from people completely. 
She wants connection, though. She wants to show the people she does love how much they mean to her, and she wants to spare them from pain. But since doing so directly would require being vulnerable, she decides to show her love through another method, protection. The problem is, the real problems of life, the ones that hurt the most, you can't protect people from that. And that's a really hard thing to accept. So instead, Barbara invents a problem, the giants, to give her something physical she can fight, something she can obsess over, something she can prepare for, something that gives her some semblance of control in a situation where control has gone away. But despite how hard she tries, how hard she pushes against the ceaseless march of life and its hardships, there is nothing she could have done to stop it. So while she wanted the right thing to do to be slaying the giants and saving her mom from one of life's cruelest diseases, the real right thing to do was be strong for the people fighting giants of their own. And if I want to go from here, I have to address my own giants. <sighs> my mom is an alcoholic. It's something that runs in our family, and she picked it up at a very young age. Her mom was an alcoholic while she was growing up, and the experience she had with her peers created an environment where that behavior was encouraged. I don't want to go too much into detail about it because it doesn't feel like it's my story to tell, but the important part you need to know is she managed to quit before she had me and my siblings. And she stayed that way throughout her entire childhood. We basically became her identity, and everything she felt, thought, and did surrounded our upbringing and our survival. But children grow up and eventually move on. And we all did. And suddenly, the thing she hung her identity around wasn't there anymore. She did her job, and she did it well. But then, what's left? So she went back to drinking. Gradually at first, in small doses, but over time, the addiction became greater until it just became overwhelming. And my dad and my siblings, for some reason, decided that I needed to know that fact for way longer than it's acceptable. They only told me during a particularly tough night when my dad admitted he didn't know what to do. I immediately dropped everything I had to head over, and without going to detail, seeing a parent or parental figure, the person you thought knew everything, that was the ultimate guide and authority, suddenly in such a vulnerable state, suffering in ways you can't understand and don't have words for. It changes you. It forces you to recontextualize everything you thought you knew about them and what they're going through. That's not to say that your pain is equal or greater than what they're going through, but you also can't deny the pain is there. And it's really fucking hard to deal with, to accept this new reality. The immediate reaction is the worst. Fight or flight kicks in. You're either gonna stick to the situation and help deal with it, or you're gonna run away in confusion and grief. I don't think anyone would blame you if you went with the latter. There's really no right way to react the first time. Even if you do stay to try to help, there's no guarantee you'll have any clue of what you're doing or if you'll just make things worse. For me, it was terrifying. I did my best to talk her down, get her to bed, followed by a lot of different conversations with the rest of the family. I did the best I could with the tools I had, and it didn't feel like nearly enough. I couldn't take the pain away. I couldn't take away her suffering, and I couldn't stop her from future suffering, no matter how much I tried. Thank God I tried. I tried so hard that night, and I tried so many other nights as the months and years went on. But no matter what reaction you have or what you do to help, you can't shake the feeling of powerlessness, of complete lack of control, because it's so beyond you. It's beyond your scope of understanding, and there's nothing you can do to fix it. And that's what's so hard. And why I Kill Giants speaks to me on such a fundamental level. When you're forced to watch somebody you love go through something you have no frame of reference for, the natural instinct is to protect. You want to protect them. You want to save them. You want to believe that if you just fight hard enough or work hard enough or say the right thing in the right way, then you can make it all stop. But you can't. It's soul crushing. You can fight everyone. You can fight your friends and family out of spite or rebellion. You can try to take on the whole goddamn world if you really want to. But nothing is going to change the fact that you're powerless. So what do you do then? What can you do? What is the right thing to do if there even is one? This is the hard part because really, the right thing to do, the thing they actually want you to do, 
is just be there. Just be present. You don't need to solve anything. You don't need to fight anyone or anything because you can't. And that's harder than it sounds because it means you have to look at it, like really look at it. Acknowledge every hard truth about a situation you don't want to admit. Admit they are suffering. Admit you have no control. Admit you don't know what's going to happen. And admit that you're scared. But you need to do that. You need to be able to face that because during the entire time you're trying to fix things or protect them, you're leaving them alone. And that's the one thing they don't want to be. It requires you to accept the vulnerability situation demands. To be able to not cast judgment, not deflect or ignore, and sit there with the person you love and just be. It's not a cure. And if it's an addiction, you have to be careful not to enable. But I believe it's the right thing to do because love will always help over shame. This to me has been one of the hardest giants I have ever had to face. You have to let go of so much to accept what seems unacceptable. That you don't know what's going to happen. And here's the kicker. For all of our resistance, for all we try to do to try to protect the ones we love from the cruelty of life, they probably don't want you to do that. They just want to know that you care and that you love them. Because whether it's a fatal illness or an addiction, the victims of these afflictions can end up feeling so isolated. And it's our job to remind them that they are not alone. Because as terrified as we are to face this, they're probably more terrified to be suffering from it. And they need our support. Not advice, not judgment, support. Because everyone deserves to be reminded of the same thing Barbara learned by Book's End. You're stronger than you think. Will it solve the problem or fix it? No. Will it take away their pain or yours? No. But just being there and reminding them that they are loved, they are seen, and they are cared for, it is the brightest light we can shine in a sea of darkness. So if you're watching this now and you have a loved one who's suffering from an addiction or a failed illness, or you're the one suffering, to those fighting your own giants, you're stronger than you think.